So rather than dump people in the middle of all of our years of study, I wanted to introduce them to this system in as logical way as possible. It seemed to me prudent to start with the five W's of journalism. Who, what, why, when, where. What is this system? Who needs it? Why do we need a system? You don't need to do anything in life in order to die. Life is pretty much as we know it, a conveyor belt. Everyone's on the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt is moving. And where it's going to stop for us is death. Everybody who is born is going to die. We don't like to think about that. We don't spend much time thinking about it, but it's true. And the reason we don't spend much time thinking about it is because we don't like the prospect. We would like to escape death in some way. The parable that the work uses is the prison parable. And it's basically this idea that we're in prison. The problem is we don't know it because we were born in the prison. Our parents were prisoners and they had us in the prison infirmary. It's all we've ever known, prison. So we grow up in prison and it's not such a bad place. We got movies on Saturday nights. Everybody gets together. They've got gyms. You can go and work out and build your body. They've got a nice bed, your own room. Yeah, it's got bars on it, but what are bars? You've known those your whole life. You didn't know there was any other kind of room. So the bars are just your room. And it's got, and you've got your own little bathroom there. You've got your own sink, your own toilet, your own bed. You've got your own bookshelf. You've got your own walls. You have your own window, maybe. Maybe not. If not, then you've got your own mirror so you can put outside the bars and look down the row to see other prisoners in other bars. Of course, you don't call them prisoners or inmates. They're your friends, your family, your cell block. It's your group, your homeboys. You don't call it prison. You call it life because you don't know anything else. But then someone comes along and they tell you, well, you know, there's something outside these walls. No. Yeah, people are free. What do you mean free? I'm free. I get a shower every day. I get to go out in the yard all the time and I get to go and work out in the gym and I get to go to the movies on Saturday nights. The only time I'm not free is if I did something wrong that the warden didn't like or the guards didn't like, then they take one of those things away from me. That's not good, then I'm not free. But the rest of the time I'm free. I'm free to do all those other things that I'm allowed to do. So you're starting to get the prison mentality, you're starting to get the idea of what it's like to be in prison, but you don't know it's prison because nobody ever told you. And somebody comes along and they tell you, but this is prison, man. There's a different world out there. And at first, you just beat him up for coming to spoil in your peace and harmony. Then somebody else comes and they tell you the same thing. We well, beat him up too. Somebody else comes, you tell them, they beat him up too. But then eventually you start to think, you know, enough of these guys come in here and tell me this. I'm starting to think maybe there's something to it. But then somebody else says, oh, that's just an old wives tale. That's just a fairy tale they tell people to make them unhappy. He's just trying to get your money. Well, you're in prison, you don't have much money. Or he's trying to get your cigarettes, or he's trying to get this, or he's trying to get that. He's trying to get something that you have. Then you figure out, finally, you are in prison. How do you get out? Can you get out? This system says that you need to escape from prison. But you can't escape from prison because you don't know how. It says that somebody who has already escaped, somebody on the outside, has to help you. They've got to show you how to do it. They've got to somehow get you the tools. They've got to put a hacksaw in a cake and make sure you get the cake so that you can hacksaw through the bars, or whatever. Or they've got to get you the tools so you can dig a tunnel and get out under the walls. And then they've got to have a car waiting for you outside so that they can take you away from the prison so that you can escape. The escape route has to be revealed by someone who's already escaped. We've got to be helped from outside. We need a map, we need tools. We need a group of fellow prisoners inside who will help us to work so that we can get out. That's what this system says. That's what this system teaches. That's the parable that it uses to give us an idea of what life is like for us. If you're still here, if you're still listening, some of this must make sense. And if it makes sense, then something inside of you knows something beyond the A influence of life. Last night I talked to some people at dinner about one of the first masters that I ever encountered. I was on the search for masters. Well, back then, the big influx of masters, people who had mastery over life, were from India. And so there was this Indian master visiting Los Angeles. And I met somebody who said, well, let's go and see this guy. I said, okay, let's go. Back then, you went to a master to get something. What you went to get was touched or your third eye opened or some kind of power or force applied to you that would enlighten you in some way, that would open up your eyes so that you would begin to see the truth of life and you could be enlightened. That was the, that was the idea behind it. In other words, it was a shortcut. 
You go to somebody else, he does it for you, and then you live happily ever after, and you have all of your needs met and your hunger is satisfied, and that's the end of that. I was just young enough and foolish enough to believe that that was a possibility. So I went to this master, and he was in this little dingy motel room. At least I think it was a motel room. It may have been an apartment. It wasn't a very nice place. It certainly wasn't where I expected a master to be. And he wasn't dressed properly. And he was Indian, East Indian. He wasn't impressive looking. He wasn't dressed in fine clothes, and, he, and his hair wasn't perfectly coiffed, and he didn't have all of the things that attract us in life. He wasn't saying anything. He wasn't teaching anything. He didn't have any answers that he was giving to people. So we went, there was a group of us that went. We went and we sat around and talked to some of his devotees and we couldn't talk to him because he didn't speak English. A master should at least be able to speak English, especially if he's going to come to America. Why come to America if you're not going to be able to speak English? And he had a bag, a brown paper bag with him. And it wasn't even a new brown paper bag. It was a crummy, old, wrinkled brown paper bag. And he'd pull the brown paper bag, he'd open up the brown paper bag, and when you go up to, to, to see him, he would reach into the brown paper bag and he would pull out a persimmon and give you a persimmon. That was it. So it's like, so what do you do with this persimmon? You know, you smash it on your third eye and then you get enlightened. Do you eat it and then magically something happens? You know, it's like, is it like a magic mushroom? Is it like, what is this? And it was just a persimmon. And that's all this guy had to give was a persimmon. It's been 30 years since I saw that guy. And the persimmon has finally taken. I understand what he gave me now. He gave me a persimmon. He gave me the only thing he could give me because what I was looking for, he couldn't give. What I was looking for, only I could get. But I wasn't looking in the right direction. Where I was looking was for a physical thing. So he gave me a physical thing. And there was no way that I could get it then. But I got it now. I got he gave me exactly what I needed to find enlightenment, a persimmon. I didn't even like persimmons. I don't think I ate it. I don't know what I did with it. I didn't build a shrine to it. I can tell you that. Some people still have the persimmon that the master gave them and they have it on an altar and it's all shriveled up and dried and they burn incense to it and bow down to it and pray to it every day, but they're still not enlightened. And that's not why he gave people the persimmons. He gave people the persimmons because he was familiar with persimmons and he knew they were good fruit and he, could, and he found them in abundance in a grocery store and bought them and this is what he gave people. Because he realized that when people came to him for something, they were coming to him for something, but it was the wrong something. And so he would give them something out of his compassion and love for them. Some would get it, some would not. Most did not. We'll pick up with this next time, probably with the prison parable, because we're out of time now. We'll try and develop this whole thing so that people who have no idea what this is about will get some kind of an idea what this is about and have an opportunity to address whether or not they're willing to do what's necessary to escape from prison and find real happiness, real harmony, real peace, and real freedom.